Good morning, uh, I'm Rega Menchinski, I'm coming from Synergize, Slovenia. And yeah, I would like to share with you some thoughts on how I believe that combination of machine learning and Earth observation can help us maybe make a planet a, a better place. And because not many of you are in the Earth observation field, I mean, at least based on the papers that uh, will be presented, I will go through the field and I will teach everything that is it about to know so that at the end, you all are experts in the earth, uh, machine learning in Earth observation and that you can go and start working in it. Now, climate change was mentioned. So this is the thing that worries me a lot recently um, because, I mean, it is an issue, right? We are hearing for quite many years that the temperatures are rising and we accepted the fact that the temperatures are rising because the carbon dioxide is rising and that this one is rising much more, um, much faster lately than it was in the past. And I hope that most people in this room um, accept the view that this rise of the carbon dioxide is somehow related to the human activity more than just a natural cycle, right? I mean, this is what the science tells us. Um, and we know what we need to do uh, pretty well. We know also that we are not doing enough, right? Um, and the carbon dioxide is rising. And I mean, we are worried, uh, we hear about these things, we think about these things, but we don't do much or we don't do anything at all. Now, the thing is that up to now, all of this was kind of, yes, yeah, stories and, and science and so on, but now this thing is becoming a reality like in our local environment. We f we're starting to feel it um, by ourselves. We are starting to feel the heat going on in the place that where we live, not somewhere out there, right? Like this year, it seems like the whole earth uh, was set on fire. I mean, these are all fires, wildfires from August, uh, from different places in the world going to the Arctic. I mean, even in Arctic, there are fires. And this was before the Amazon rainforest uh, was set on fire at the end of August. So, I mean, this was done before that. So it's really, really horrible. Um, we hear that ice is melting in places where there was not melt, uh, the ice melting before. And we hear the fires in the places where there are glaciers, which again is a horrible thing that this is possible. And we, we are starting to feel this, right? I mean, in India, Chennai, one of the largest cities, went uh, out of water this year. Um, and it doesn't seem that it will get uh, better soon. And it's, I mean, it's not just one city, many places in India are facing the same issue. And it's not just India, many places in the world, like South Africa and, and, and other places, the same thing everywhere, right? So it's, it's really an issue, and this is why uh, I, I find it so important. Now, the good thing in all of this is that, that the, all the things that, that we were looking at uh, were, uh, were possible because of the revolution that's happening in Earth observation that made it possible for us to really clearly see these things like with our own eyes through the satellite images, right? And I mean, Earth observation is not new. It's there for like a couple of decades. But until recently, this was a game of like big industry players, right? Like Airbus and Digital Globe or Maxar, as they are called. Um, because, I mean, like the billion uh, euro companies, because it was really expensive to build satellites to buy data. Now, five or 10 years ago, there were startups that were starting to go in this field, like Google and Planet. Um, but they were still shelving hundreds of millions of dollars to get through to that. I mean, it was really, really expensive and not possible to approach it. But then, a couple of years ago, these guys came along. They are Sentinel satellites from the European Union Copernicus mission. Um, and they are similar to Landsat, which is there for a while already, the US. Uh, but they're just enough better that they really are, are making a difference. I mean, what these satellites give us is they give us every few days the picture of the, um, er the, the whole world, like of each and every place in the world in either optical or radar. And very importantly, these data are available free of charge to anyone, right? Now, combining this with the cloud infrastructure, which is another part of revolution, you have uh, um, Amazon and Google and some others who are actually storing all this data. And we are talking about petabytes of data here, right? So it's really a lot of data. Sentinels are producing about 25 terabytes each day. They're putting it on the clouds. And you can go there to the cloud and start processing it. I mean, they pay for the storage. Obviously, we need to pay uh, for the processing when we go there. But it's really, really uh, um, accessible. 
I mean, it's so accessible that a company like ours, like a 60-person company, far from the millions and billions out there, was able to do a Google Maps kind of a application, which gives you access in the web browser. If you go in Sent uh, and Google Sentinel Playground, you will you'll be able to see it right now. You can go to anywhere in the world. You see the recent data. And then you can go back in time, like each couple of days, you have uh, a different set of data. And we were able to do this without a significant investment. It's really, the, I mean, this is the revolution, that you have the data available in such an easy manner. And I mean, here we are talking about dense time series where you can really observe how Earth is changing. You can get this either as images or statistics. And the, I mean, it's a material for the machine learning, right? Now, what we are amazed of is that when we did these applications like EO Browser and Sentinel Playground, which are free of charge, and then we are looking at how people are using it. I mean, people with just their browser, but the, each of them have their different interests, different backgrounds, different uh, know-how, and they, they, ad they address it differently, right? This guy here in the middle, that's an official in UK here, who is using our free application to search for illegally irrigated fields in, in England, I think, uh, in the drought of at affected areas. And I mean, he's going there and penalizing the farmers. This guy, He's observing the US military, who, which is building an airfield in Niger, in Africa. I mean, in a, in a free web application, something that was a science fiction before, like only available in movies. And you have lots and lots of these stories all around. Now, the problem, though, is that there is so much of data that it's not even feasible to look at everything. I mean, it's simply too much of it. And this is where we need machine learning uh, to help us, computers, to shift through all the data that is out there and then find the relevant parts, right? Now, satellite images are images. So, and, and, and many of you are experts in machine learning, and you know that imagery, you have a computer vision, and this is a well-researched uh, field. You have lots of tools that are very well <coughs> um, operating. And you have the image net, which is like a, a set of labeled images. That being said, these images are usually focused to Cats and dogs and faces, you know, the things that are important in a today social media world, right? They're not really applicable to, to Earth observation. Um, in Earth observation, we have a, our own like, image kind of uh, image net, it's called SpaceNet, and there you have labels of buildings and planes and ships and cars and airfields, and then you can actually put these labels in the TensorFlow. Um, and, you can, uh, and you can put imagery in and you can count cars or you can count ships and, and planes and then you can sell these to hedge funds to know how much traffic the, the uh, Walmart had. But Earth observation is so much more than that, right? Now, oof, uh, hopefully you can see something uh, the, or maybe you can put the lights down a bit. Um, so can you do that? Yeah. Ah, it's better. So what we see here is um, Amazon rainforest uh, in Brazil, deforestation happening. Um, you can see images one year apart, and you can see how things are changing. And if you, I mean, it's not so, so nicely, but you can see there uh, in, the, in the north, you see the, the large part, like 10 or 20 square kilometers being, being defor uh, deforested. And you can, if I ask you, to find changes in these images, it's an easy task, right? And this is something that uh, um, the computer can also do quite easily, change detection uh, pretty straightforward. But now, if I put instead of the uh, uh, image from 2019, image that is just two months apart from that, you still see a lot of changes, um, a lot of changes, but many of these changes are not deforestation, right? They are just normal crop, uh, crop cycles, like right? thing being harvested or being sowed and so on. And you have lots of these changes happening in nature that are actually irrelevant from the point of uh, um, looking at things. But then you have some things that are actually deforestation. And now this is where it's getting challenging, how to actually uh, um, find the relevant information in all these images. Then you have these guys, clouds, lots of them. Um, lots of changes, but completely irrelevant, right? I mean, yeah, there are clouds there. Nobody's interested in that. Um, then you have haze, right? Uh, again, if you look at these two images, they look very much different, and, uh, and I mean, but the haze is, again, irrelevant thing. But then what you do have the, up there is smoke from the wildfires, and this is relevant. And now how you can, 
how you, I mean, we can, we are, uh, the persons are intelligent beings, but how, can com how you can teach computer to separate haze from the smoke, right? It's not, this is where it's, it's getting uh, not trivial. Now, uh, what we do have, luckily, is that we have multispectral data. So in Earth observation, you're not dealing just with red, green, and blue that we are all used to, but you also have infrared and, and shortwave infrared, and this makes it easier to separate some things, and you can clearly see and also uh, observe from the computer point of view differences up there when there is wildfire happening, or the fire might, might not be wildfire because it was set by humans, uh, and, and this, this is easier but it's also making the whole thing more complicated because you have lots of data. Now, in Earth observation, it's all about time series, right? And this is a typical time series that one has to deal with when uh, you are uh, trying to do machine learning. And you see that it's quite a challenging piece of data because it's quite, um, what can I say, uh, fuzzy. Now, this is the Amazon rainforest, so it's, uh, it's more cloudy than most other parts of the world, but that being said, here in UK, it's not much better, right? Um, there are lots of clouds here as well. Now, it's not just clouds. You also have these kind of things, right? Uh, your technical uh, errors that you have um, image moving because the pixels are not well aligned. Then what you have, if you observe here the, um, this thingy, and then you have the shadow, which is changing because of the sun angle is changing because of the different uh, uh, season. You have cloud shadows, I mentioned that. You have um, sun angles. You have various uh, resolutions. What we are looking at here is 10 meters Sentinel-2. We are used to Google Maps where you have half a meter resolution. Then you have uh, um, the, the, the 100 meter resolution. So you, you are looking at things from different angles. So in order to, to, to uh, work with, the, with this data in machine learning, you, what you need to do is build this kind of stacks. Um, where you combine, where you slice the data through time and through the, through the spectrum, and then you filter out everything that is irrelevant, like clouds, and then you interpolate something so that you get um, a, a chunk that you actually can fit in the normal uh, machine learning tool that you can work with. Then when you do that, um, it's challenging on how to apply the model that you uh, did on other places of the world, right? If you do the model for identifying water, this will probably work quite OK in other places as well, because water looks more or less the same. But if you do a model for the crop classification and you train it here in UK, and you try to apply it in Australia, it will probably not work well because you have a shift in the seasons, right? And you don't even need to go to Australia. You can just go 100 miles north or south, and you'll have a problem. So we have lots of these transfer learning uh, things that, that actually uh, make a difference whether your model works nice only in the training set, like uh, in a research paper, or actually it's usab usable for a wider uh, scale. Now, where there are challenges, there are also lots of opportunities, right? First one is that there's lots and lots of data available. Um, I mean, these are just the Sentinels. So I mentioned Sentinel-2, which is the optical, 10-meter uh, resolution. Then you have Sentinel-3, which is 300-meter resolution. But it gives you, so the Sentinel-2 gives you data every five days in each place of the world. Sentinel-3 gives you data every day. So you can now combine 300 meter resolution every day with 10 meter resolution every five days. Then you have Sentinel-1, which is radar, which sees through clouds. And you can combine these things where you have lots of cloudy data, or you where you want to see some movements in the Earth. Sentinel-5P is emissions. So you have really lots and lots of, and these are just Sentinels. You have Landsat, you have commercial data, you have lots of, of, of satellite data. And you also have lots of labels. I mean, uh, here the image net or space net is not so relevant because you have actual uh, um, data from the ground because the, the um, governments are quite good at tracking things. Like you have building registers in most of the developed countries. So you have these polygons of buildings everywhere, I mean, all around the world, not in all the countries, but lots and lots of these data. And they are up to date and they are updated. So you can look through time. Then um, you have, for agriculture purposes, usually agriculture is related to some subsidies to farmers, and they track things you have. In Europe, we have this land parcel identification system and crop declarations, which also give you a very good idea of what was growing somewhere. You have lots of registers of landslides, forest, uh, re forest wildfires, uh, um, uh, the, the, the floods. Everything is usually registered somewhere, and you can take this data from the governments and usually it's open and public, and you can just take it and, and, and rely on it. And then you go into the IoT 
field which I mean gives you sensors from the ground which you can then combine with the satellite and that gives you another dimension. And last but not least, you have physics, right? I mean, with Earth observation, it's very important that we are looking at things on the, on the Earth which are mandated by physics. And we should take this into account. I'm I saying this because I see too often the uh, computer scientists who are well um, equipped with, I don't know, TensorFlow, and they take labels, and they take uh, satellite images, they throw everything together, and they get nice results. But they, they are nice results just in that specific small uh, experiment that they are doing. And I'm, like, if you put in also some knowledge about how things work, like that you, you can have ice, you don't have ice in, in UK in summer, right? Unless elevation is about, I don't know, <coughs> 1,000 meters or so. So you can put all these physics rule in, uh, uh, rules of physics in, and you can, you can get much better models. And you should do that. Now, now that I got all of you interested in this, and now you'd want to, um, to give it a try, let me give you some guidance. First of all, you have satellite data. Uh, you need to teach yourself about GeoTIFF, JPEG 2000, SCDF, ZAR. These are the typical formats. Then you need to know a bit about the coordinate projections, like Web Mercator or WGS84, UTM, because you have data in different uh, coordinate systems. You need to know how to apply the terrain model to the satellite images, because terrain is 3D and satellite images are always 2D, and you need to do something with that. Mosaicing, cataloging, all these things. So this is, this is everything that you need to learn, then you can start working. Or you can just use one of the APIs out there, which actually make all these steps for you. I mean, this one is, is developed by us, so a bit of a commercial. But the point is that you can go to an API and say, I want data in this area for this specific time period, uh, for that specific configuration. I know I'm interested in radar. And you get it immediately, and you can integrate this in your own process, and you, you, you have the whole world uh, at your hand. And you can get one API for different kind of missions so that you can only integrate it one, once, and then you, you, you have the things running for different uh, satellites. And it's really, really easy, right? I mean, um, it's so easy that a computer, uh, um, like aware person, can start working with it in a couple of hours. Even though you don't know anything about dirt observation, it's really becoming super easy. Now, um, to make it even more simple, what we are doing is that we are developing, uh, we have developed already, the open source Python package, because the Python is kind of the technology of the data science, uh, called EOLEARN, which bridges the gap between Earth observation and all these well-known technologies in the machine learning, like TensorFlow, MXNet, LightGBM, and so on. The, this EOLEARN helps you to configure the workflow happening uh, with the data before it goes into the typical uh, machine learning tools. And I mean, if you're looking at this uh, machine learning exercise, which usually uh, includes only a tiny bit of machine learning and all the stuff around it, you have lots of tools that help you with that. So um, for the data verification and collection, there are open source tools like Label Maker and Classification App and so on. For this analysis and feature extraction, you have Learn and various other machine learning open source libraries. For this, you have uh, Amazon and Google and the like. So I'm, if you combine things properly, you don't sp spend much of the time here, and you can really focus to machine learning. So you can get data in different, uh, uh, different resolutions, different content based on what you're interested in. You can get labels uh, from different places, also well organized for the machine learning. And you can also find some uh, actual workflow so that if you know, don't know anything about uh, um, Earth observation, you can take a Jupyter notebook uh, and you can download the data. We prepared all the data um, that you simply download the chunk and you have in half an hour the process of land classification working without any know-how, uh, uh, advanced know-how needed. And you have it working for one place and then you can just adjust this based on what you want to explore further. So it's really, really easy to, to get into. Now, to, to, to show how, how, I mean, how easy it is to, to make an impact, um, I want to tell you about this Global Surface Water Explorer, or actually the idea behind it. So Global Surface Water Explorer was a project, uh, is a project, uh, a joint project by Google and Joint Research Center. And what they did is they processed the whole um, air hive of Landsat data, whole globe, and they were searching for water, right? For each pixel in the world, they were searching whether there was water or not at a specific point in time. And then if you click on some part, you simply get information how there was water all the time, right? 
Uh, if you click in this northern part of the lake, you see uh, there was water most of the time, but not uh, all the time, and there was more or less water. And I mean, this, this thing was a very important uh, exercise because it finally gave us like the society information on the, about the water on the global scale. Um, it was published in Nature, so it was really a big thing, right? Uh, that being said, um, it was quite expensive to run, right? I mean, this is what they stated in the, the paper that they spent 10 million processing hours to calculate these things. So that's, that's something that probably most of us cannot afford because simply it costs too much. And even for them, um, so the, the paper was published in 2016 and then for two years the data were not updated because it was probably just too much of overhead. Now recently they moved the, the data to up to 2018, but it's not up to date, right? And uh, we were looking at this and said, oh, we can do something like that, right? We, um, we have know-how, we have tools, we don't have 10 million hours of the computing time. So um, we address things a bit differently. And, and this is again where the physics come into play. We said, we will not process the whole world. We will not process the oceans because in oceans the, the water is always there, right? It doesn't make sense to search for water in oceans. Similarly, if you go to Sahara Desert, there is no water there, right? And we know that, so we don't need to, uh, to look for it. So what we did, we said, we will search for the, um, some number. We said 10,000 for the, for the beginning simply because it's uh, difficult to, to find the, uh, these important water bodies. We said we will search for water bodies and we'll uh, s select those, just those, uh, these areas. And then we'll do the same like Google and Joint Research Center did. We will uh, search for water in these areas and then we'll uh, map this down. So this is the Chennai uh, lake that we were looking at and you can see how the water is disappearing. And then, I mean, you get this, the, the data in the database and you can visualize and so on. Now what is important, two things here. The system is designed in a way that um, it's updated every time the satellite imagery comes in, right? We, every time that we have a new satellite imagery, poof, you have the data there. And another thing that is very important is that this thing costs less than 100 euros a month to operate. So it's really, really cheap. If you do it smartly, you can do large projects like this uh, without any significant uh, budget. Now, we did this uh, water body, so you don't need to, uh, to go there. Um, so you have some more challenges to tackle, right? The deforestation is a very important one because obviously the forest is something that can actually save us from the disaster of the climate change. And uh, what would be nice to have is a tool that actually tracks all the forest and alerts whenever there is some deforestation happening, like real deforestation, not uh, just, uh, I don't know, harvest somewhere. And then uh, push this alert to, I don't know, whomever, so that we can put the pressure to the governments to actually do something about these things, right? Uh, if, if that would be an ongoing process, I think it would help tremendously. If you're more of a techie person, what you could do is you could play with super resolution. Super resolution is when you have an image in like low resolution, like Sentinel-2 in 10 meters, and you want to make it sharper, and to do that, you train the model with the, the, the very high resolution data, like half a meter or drone data, even more. And then you kind of apply this model to the low resolution and then it poof automatically sharpens the data. I mean, this is from the actual paper. Um, so the, the, there are already people working in this field and there are results which look promising. Uh, and I think that you can go even further than that. That being said, it's important to be aware when doing that, that you don't start inventing the data too much, right? I mean, obviously, here where we have these pixel values, we don't have all these details that we see here. So this is what the model kind of thought that this is how it looked like. And we need to be, uh, uh, we need to take care that we just don't create another deep fake, right, in the satellite imagery that we'll start, uh, start looking at things that are actually not uh, uh, there. Or uh, what you can do is you can observe this stream of images uh, that are coming in on a, let's say, daily or, or every couple of uh, days, and you can start thinking, oh, what will be the next image? And by, I mean, by doing that, you can actually start predicting the future. Now, I hope that uh, um, I got you interested in this field. I hope that next year when there's this conference, there is at least one session dedicated to Earth observation uh, uh, with lots of papers. And I hope that the knowledge that is in this room uh, about the machine learning is actually uh, um, would be used to, to help us to make a planet a better place for us uh, and for everyone else. 
uh, so that we stop doing the things that we are doing, so that it makes it us aware of the things that how we are destroying the, 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 uh, the world and try to push us in the direction not to do that anymore. And when doing that, don't forget that you need to also take into account physics, not just the machine learning tools. Thank you very much. If you need some further information, some links here. Thank you, Gregor Mielzinski.